So hang around those investors that are doing deals so that that enthusiasm, that excitement, their paychecks, their money they're making can fill you when the time gets tough because it's going to get tough. But you need that encouragement. You need to have somebody there that you can say, it works, it works, it works. If you're all alone, those are the investors that will drop out after a month, two months, three months, because they have no support group. Make the meetups, make the rears, make all those your support groups to keep your motivation up. Paid resources. When we're marketing deals, a lot, people don't realize that real estate agents is a great source to market your deals too. We all realize that, right? There's a service that's called eCampaign Pro that you could create a flyer inside of that service and it will automatically send that flyer to 5, 10, 15,000 real estate investors. I'm sorry, real estate agents in the zip codes where your deals are at. And you're only paying for the ones where the agent actually opens up and read the flyer. So when you talk about how can you market my deals, that service costs $29 to get your deals in front of 5,000, 10,000 real estate agents who have buyer's lists. One-time fee, $29. They have a monthly plan too. But eCampaign Pro is a great way to get your deals out there to the masses, as well as Facebook ads and stuff like we talked about in the other campaigns. Okay. Let's talk about step eight, contract to buy. Now you've got your deals out there looking for a buyer and you found one. How do I handle that buyer who called me up and say, I like your property, I wanna buy it. Okay. First of all, a lot of people say, well, can I really sell? Keep in mind, guys, as an investor, when you have a property under contract, you have something what's called equitable interest. Equitable interest allows you to sell that equitable interest, or should I say the law allows you to sell equitable interest to someone else. So when you get a property under contract as a wholesaler, you're not doing anything illegal. You have the right to sell your equitable interest that a contract gives you for a profit. Also realize, when you put a property under contract, you're controlling it. You haven't purchased it. The point of putting it under contract is to control. To flip or wholesale it is where you make your profit. Don't be afraid of the paperwork. Most people get caught up in putting a contract on a property as them buying the house. No, you have equitable interest to buy that house based on certain terms and conditions being met. You can keep that equitable interest, meaning you can execute the purchase or you can sell your equitable interest, flip it as a wholesale deal to another end buyer. Most common way to close is what's called an A to B close. An A to B close is you as the investor have the property under contract from the seller and then you wholesale it to your buy and hold investor or your rehabber. That's A to B close. Simple, almost any title company will do that. It's a good way to really do the business. Now, you have what's also called the A to B, B to C close. Now the A to B goes the same way. You get the property under contract, except when you get the property under contract, 
you're going to actually close on it. And then you're going to sell it to your C buyer. Now, somebody would say, well, why would I want to do that as opposed to just doing the A to B? One reason is that not all rehabbers, but some rehabbers have been known to look at your profit and say, you're going to make all of that? I'm not going to pay that for that property. They're looking at your money because you're going to make 50 and they're only going to make 70. They're saying to themselves, $20,000 is good enough for you. When you do a double closing, that's a good way to not have that be seen, what you paid for it from the seller. Do not let it be seen what your profit was. So that's why some would do it that way. We do both. Depending on the investor who we're selling the property to, if we have good experience with that prior person, we don't have a problem showing them the numbers because I know these buyers that we use, we work with. If it's somebody we never worked with before, we may use what's called gap funding or transitional funding, or should I say transactional funding. Transactional funding is temporary funding that will buy or allow you to buy the property up front so that you can sell it that same day to your end buyer. That way you can do the double close. Now this costs you a couple of points, but it's not, not that bad when it comes to the other alternative, the person backing out of your deal and you're not having a buyer. So you have to decide what is going to be the best way for me to handle my profit. If I'm making a big profit, do I just do a straight A to B close? Or do I do it A to B, B to C close? It's up to you to decide that. Um, we push all our mastermind students for B to C because we got transaction lining, funding lined up for them. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about the A to B close, is that like you, uh, you're assigning that to closing table so it's just one closing? It's just one closing. You got the contract, you assigned your contract to your end buyer. That's it. Any other questions regarding this? Yes. Yeah, um, offhand, um, what's the name of that company we work a lot with? Do me a favor, drop me an email to cblair109 at gmail and I'll send you the name of the company with the information. Yes. A point means a percentage of the loan. For example, if a loan is $10,000 and it's one point, that's $1,000. So a point means it's percentage of the loan. No, I'm sorry, I meant 100,000. Yeah, that's 100,000 100, is 1,000. Um, 10,000 is $100. Okay, step nine, walk it through the table. Now, once again, there's processes you have to have in place when you have that buyer and you're ready to close that deal. That buyer is ready to give you money. That buyer is ready to say, ready to sign the paperwork. Make sure that the control, when you control on the buy side, you select and close the deal correctly. Now, here's what I mean by that. Make sure your buyer is a qualified buyer. They need to have proof of funds. You need to know that they have the money to be able to buy this property. You want to make sure that no one is taking control of your property that is not qualified to take it. They must use your own title company. We do have some leeway in this. When I work with investors that I know, I don't have a problem with working with their title company because I know how the, 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 re the reputation of that investor. But when, if I have the gold, I'm going to control the closing. Now, Merlin Law states that the buyer has the right to choose whatever title company they want. They do. But if you want to buy my property, you're going to use my title company. 
unless I have a relationship with you and I know that there's not going to be any hanky-panky going on. Now, what I mean by hanky-panky is this. You'll have some situations where you use somebody else's title company, and next thing you know, you got extension after extension after extension. And you're being told, this is the reason why, or this is the reason why, or this is the reason why. And you have to listen or you have to believe what you're being told because you're using their title company who has been known to make excuses for their buyers to get them more time. So I don't want to have excuses unless I'm making the excuses. And that's by controlling the transaction with my title company, who I know when I call up, they're going to tell me the truth because they value my business a lot more than someone who they're just working with for the first time. So I'm going to control that process and for the most part, insist that they use my title company. New investors, you could decide to go in this direction or not. You may do 10 deals and you may have only one issue because you use somebody else's title company. But um, I've just seen stories, heard, heard horror stories of people using other people's title company, not being able to get their deposit back, not being able to do this, not being able to do that. I just prefer to control the process because I know my people's not going to lie to me. They must put a down payment in earnest deposit, preferably to my title company. Now, I have three steps. <laughs> They can give me the down payment, or they can put the, title, the down payment in my title company. If I've done business with them, I don't have a problem with having them put the deposit in their title company. Like I said, there's an exception for me if I've done business with the person before. But they must do one of the first or second. I'm not going to push the issue if they don't want to give me the deposit. But I will push the issue if they're not going to want to put the deposit in my title company. You're not going to get my deal. The question is, is there a particular dollar amount you want as a deposit? There is no set rule. Most of the time, it's somewhere between 2,500 and 5,000. Um, most of the time, you see numbers of 2,500. You want to make sure that that buyer has skin in the game, that they're a real buyer, along with proof of funds and so on. So that's normally what the, most people ask for. But there is no, what you would call, what you should ask for, what minimum amount or maximum amount. It's non-refundable. Absolutely. Great question. It's a non-refundable deposit. Mm-hmm. Well, the question is, should you get an actual bank statement or should you get those letters? The reason why the letters work, because the people who give the letters to don't check them out. That's the reason why they work. Um, most of the time, I'm getting bank statements. I'm getting IRA statements. I'm getting um, contacts to hard money lenders that they're working with, using them as proof of funds and so on. Most of the time, you're correct. I would get that type of documentation. Go about verifying the proof of funds. Information on the letters, telephone numbers if there is any. If the letter looks suspicious, don't use it. Also, whatever company that is, just do a Google search. You do a Google search, you'll see if they provide proof of funds letters. Yes. Typically, how long does it take for a title company to bring back title? That also depends. Uh, most title companies literally can do a closing in 14 days. You got some that can do it in seven. On average, I tell my homeowner, um, 30 business days. 30 business days is actually 45 days. So that's what I usually put in our contract, 30 business days. 
if I know that, that urgency is the issue with the, with the homeowner, remember we're talking about motivation, then I'll close quicker. But my contract will say up to 30 business days and or before August the 24th. Notice the term and or before. Do not allow daisy chains unless it's already a... Yeah, it's supposed to be, uh, uh, yeah, uh, unless it's already agreed, I don't know what that word is. <laughs> Ninth grade education, guys. Unless it's already agreed, a daisy chain is you wholesaling a property to another wholesaler who's wholesaling the property to another wholesaler who's wholesaling the property to another buyer. Next thing you know, it's four of y'all at the title company making $2,000 a piece. The only time I do a daisy chain situation is if I'm already working with that investor as a JV partner and I say, hey, and here's how that works for me. Fact, if your property stays on the market for more than 14 days and it doesn't sell, chances are one of these three things are in place. One of which is the property is overpriced. Two, the actual location of the property. Three, the actual repairs on the property. Those are the three factors and the only three factors why a property that's a good deal should not stay on the market or should I say should not sell within 14 days or less. So if somebody's calling you who have a property been on the market for a month, the first thing you want to know is why has that property not sold? Because any good deal will sell. The exception to that, if the person who's doing the selling don't have a good buyer's list. So you should automatically turn your nose up when wholesalers send you deals that's three, four, five, six weeks old and start looking into why it has that property not sell. It's going to either be the location is so bad nobody wants to invest in it, the price is so high that it's just overpriced in the market, or the repairs is so much, regardless of how much you buy it for, you can't get a good deal. Those are the three reasons why properties do not sell. So definitely raise an eyebrow when a person has a deal that's been on the market for a month or two months or three months. The only time I give my deals to a JV partner to sell for me is after 14 days and I have not sold it. Because then I'm saying, I did everything I could. Let me see if his buyer's list would work. And at that point, I'm willing to split that profit with him if he's got his buyer's list to buy it. But that's the only time I'm JVing with other investors for a daisy chain type of situation. After 14 days of me doing all the marketing that I know and I couldn't sell it. Step 10. I know what you guys are saying. It's about time. I actually, I'm actually on time, guys. We know the nine steps. The tenth is simple. Find a good mentor that fits. I'm going to say that again. If you're going to go into the direction of I want to accelerate my learning curve, you have to. Find a good mentor that fits you, your personality, not all mentors are created equally. There's a number of ways in which you can work with a mentor, free versus paid. I started out with a free mentor that I paid with my time. I gave him eight months of my life to work in his business full time for $50 a week and lunch. What he got out of the deal is very cheap labor. 
what I got out of the deal is the education I needed to get off the ground doing real estate investing. Learning the insides from a person who was doing it. Question you want to ask. Is that mentor currently doing deals now? Or was it 20 years ago? If you're going in this direction, because you don't have to, there's investors in this room that won't need a mentor that will figure it out on their own. But if you're going to accelerate that process and not figure it out through mistakes and errors, you want to make sure that investor is investing, that mentor is investing now. Most of the strategies don't change. What change is the law to execute them. That's what changes. So somebody that was investing 10 years ago, that's my Heisman pose. <laughs> somebody that invests 10 years ago may not be up to date on what's working now. Not to mention, I'm just kind of particular. My mentor didn't charge me anything, but over the years, I had some of the best mentors that I had to pay for. One who is no longer here anymore, a gentleman by the name of Jack Miller out of Jacksonville, Florida taught me everything I know about creative deal structuring. Oh my goodness, this man, well, how good was he? Jack taught Robert Allen. That's how good Jack Miller was. And I would pay him $5,000 a pop each and every time I would go to his master class. And then I would pay him $285 a pop every time I would go to one of his workshops. It's all content. That's the only thing he sells is the admittance into it. No packages, none of that kind of stuff. And this guy has made me more money with my creative deal thinking than I could ever thank him for. Because it's a situation where some of these advanced strategies, you have to really dig in books and all that kind of crap to understand what the structure is. And to have somebody break it down to you like you're a ninth grade dropout, man, it's priceless. So I did pay for my education after the fact. Jack Miller. And you can still get some of his stuff um, it's, it's priceless when it comes to deal structuring. Also, is the, is the mentor local or not? It's a big one. We have this mastermind program. And I would think, I think it's like every six or seven mastermind members would tell me, Charles, I paid 45000 to this company. I'm not going to say the name fortune builders <laughs> and I didn't learn that one thing they did this they had me call this person and it sounded like the person was calling me from Timbuktu <laughs> I agree to accelerate your learning curve, you should, or if you're able to afford to, get a mentor that's going to take you with them. The key, is a men key with a mentor isn't somebody that's coaching you. The key to a mentor is somebody that's with you. That's the key. 
If you have to call them up between four and six to get an answer, that's not a mentor. That's an arrangement. If you can only call on Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays, that's not a mentor. Problems don't only happen on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. You want somebody that you can call, somebody that's willing to go with you, somebody that's willing to help negotiate with you, somebody that's willing to let you help and use their resources that they're currently doing and working today. If you want to go down that direction. That's the key. Do the mentor teach the specialty that you want to learn? Or should I say need to learn? True story. I had a mentoring stu mastermind student come to me and say, Charles, I want to do wholesaling. Oh, health selling is good. Well, I could do all these deals. I'm going to make $5,000 a deal. Oh, my goodness. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. One month he went by. Charles, this wholesale is too hard. Man, I didn't know it was going to be all this. I mean, I, I, like, I like dealing with these, bird, these homeowners and stuff, but, man, um, it's just not, it's just, I just don't have the right personality. Okay. Let's see what fits your personality. So we took that person from wanting to do wholesaling to doing tenant placement and guaranteed rent. Five months later, they own 15 properties and they're doing on average three tenant placement deals a month. Because you have to find that strategy that suits your personality best. If you are a person that wants quick income, the strategy of choice is going to be wholesaling or tenant placement or guaranteed rent. If you're the person that's looking for large lump income, that strategy is going to be rehabbing or rent to own. If you're looking for that generational wealth strategy where you can retire in 10, 15 years with 30 houses. That strategy is going to be buying and holding or master leasing. Fit the strategy that best suits your needs now, not what the guru said is the hottest strategy out there. Look at your current financial situation. What do I need real estate to do for me? And then pick with your mentor and see if that strategy is the best strategy for you. That's the key. And last but not least, is it truly one-on-one? -on -one? If you know you, and you know that you've been to the workshops, and you know that you've read the books, and you know that you've seen all the other stuff, you got a good sense of why you're not doing deals now. And most of the time, that reason why is because you are not being pushed. You are not being guided. You are not being around someone who is holding you accountability. We all need some degree of accountability. For some of us, and I was one of those persons, if I did not have my mentor pushing me to do this, to do that, it wouldn't get done. If I didn't have someone over my shoulders making me realize that I'm the direct reason for my success, you have to realize that. And it goes back to your reason for wanting to do this business. 
your why, your motivation. For me, it was simple. I have a ninth grade education. And if I did not make real estate investing work, I was going right back to be a security guard, work at a fast food restaurant, or whatever a non-educated black male can do. That was my reality, and that was my motivation. That's the reason for my success, is that fear of if I didn't make it, this is all I have to fall back on. Discover what your motivation is. Find someone to help you through that situation. And it's a wonderful feeling when you guys click with that mentor. There's no better feeling in the world than working with somebody that has your vision and has your back. Any questions? Good question. I get that a lot. Charles, what's the minimum amount of time required to get su be successful? The question should be, Charles, what do I need to do to be successful? Don't measure it by the quickest and the fastest way to get there. Because if I get there fast, it's going to be even more better. You get there fast, you're going to make mistakes and lose your shirt. Get out of that texting I want a deal tonight when I push the magic red button, button mentality. It doesn't work like that. It can come a lot quicker when you have someone to work with, but there's no way of getting around the time you have to put into it. You can save time with systems, automation, and so on. Brittany is an expert on automations and systemization. I consider myself an expert on automation and systemization. But that still does not take place in regards to what needed for me to learn the automation and systemization. Even though I can push the red button, I still have to set up that red button to give me the outcome that I want. So there is no set time or quickest you can become successful. I know investors that have been, uh, and I'm gonna, I keep using the mastermind because that's all I'm going to use because I know what they're doing. Investors have been in the mastermind for three weeks and got, Tamika and them, three weeks, got their first deal. Investors have been in the mastermind for four weeks. Investors have been in the mastermind for two months. So it's, it's, it depends on that person's time allotment and their commitment. Because you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Any other questions?